and welcome to Telecom Predictions for the Future of 5G, powered by IoT Marketing and a part of Industry Insights Webinars. I'm your host, Tiffany Nielsen. And with me today, we've got Patrick Millender from Connect 5G. How are you, Patrick? And also Carl Weaver. Hi, Carl. Good morning from Seattle. And Patrick is visiting us all the way from St Stockholm? Yeah, Stockholm. 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 Okay. Sweden. Oh, yeah. nice in the yes. summertime. Sweden. Yeah. And then going around clockwise here, we've got Moose, and you are in California, correct? That's right. Hi there. Nice meeting all you. All right. And we've got Sean. Hi, Sean. Sean Cook from Group Purchasing Resources. And he's in Seattle. Seattle, Kirkland, to be specific. All right. Great. Well, we've got a very exciting presentation for you today, and our entire team has been working very hard to bring you this very educational uh, presentation, and we've got lots of golden nuggets that I think you'll all find very valuable no matter what your education level is on 5G. There's something here today for everyone. Well, oh, we've got some some birthdays. It is Mark Evaristo's birthday. Well, happy birthday, Mark. We're glad that you could join us this morning. And to get things started, let's go ahead and pull up the agenda. We're going to start with our welcome and introductions and then follow that with a panel style discussion with four different parts. And then we will have a Q&A as well as some closing remarks. So let's go ahead and get started here. And once again, I'm Tiffany Nielsen. And not only will I be your host and moderator, and I'm a part of IoT Marketing, um, IoT Marketing is actually the producer of these events. And so when we were working on coming up with a plan, as we saw the pandemic looming in the future, uh, we decided that we needed to pivot from trade shows, which I'm sure that all of us miss very much, to webinars. And as we started to see this entire thing unfold, we started looking at all of the different industries that would be affected by COVID-19 and realizing that we were all going to need to join forces to keep everyone connected during these very, very uncertain times. So once again, we do appreciate you being here today and we invite you to join our community and not just be here for this webinar, but all of our webinars as they have this underlying message of you know, giving you tools that you can survive and thrive with uh, for 2020 and beyond. And can so I, I also a, want to give, yes, absolutely. Can I make absolutely. a public announcement statement? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, uh, baseball will resume this week, and that oh. is a very good thing for normalcy in the United States. Hallelujah. Progress. <laughs> and so I also want to give a shout out this morning to Johanna Speakman and Cynthia Baker, our founders from IoT Marketing, and also Jennifer Davis, who is our director of content and the rest of our team, they've all been working tirelessly to make this happen. So if you're in need of any of their end-to-end -end marketing services, contact us, IoT Marketing. We'll give you the contact information at the end of the webinar. And once again, if you have questions, you can put them into the chat and then we'll get those. Uh, we'll get to those at the end. To tell you a little bit about myself, um, I embarked on my journey into tech after many years in doing marketing and trade shows in Ohio and also here in Las Vegas. And I've been able to uh, be honored with such names as 30 most innovative companies of 2019, 30 most admired companies to watch, and top 10 remote monitoring solutions. And we were creating a mobile IoT module, but what do you know? It got stuck in certification due to the virus. So I think a, a lot of people had some shifts due to that. So now I'm so happy to be on the team here at IoT Marketing. So with that, I pass it over to Patrick. Thank you, Tiffany, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. It's an honor. And um, a bit about myself, I'm joining you from Stockholm, as Tiffany said. I'm normally based in Dallas, just visiting here over the summer for a while. And um, my background is I have 27 years of experience from the um, emerging tech world, and 24 of those years I spent with the Ericsson Group, living in seven countries around the world. The last Three years I spent with uh, in the AI IoT space, and last year we launched Connect 5G. And in essence, what we do in Connect 5G, we we equip um, anyone that's deploying LTE or 5G networks with a 
remote integration center, a world-class one. So looking forward to sharing more as we go. Great, thank you. Thank you. And next we've got Sean Cook. Well, thank you, or Tiffany. should I say Sean Supply Chain Cook? Thank you so much, Tiffany. Tiffany, a little bit about me is I spent the first seven of the 26 years in telecommunications, uh, expanding that voice data and TV network. And really what happened many years ago is I saw technology was going to change at one point in time. And one day, all of a sudden, one of my customers was billing about uh, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a month in voice services. And what Apple was was a direct connect to changing everything from voice over to the internet. And all of a sudden, not only did the income go down, it was great for the customer, but technology wise, it became you know a lot faster. So with that in mind, I said I had to make a supply chain and technology change, and that is to go into buying power. So we have over $18 billion of buying power. What we do it was with 3,000 vendors worldwide in most foreign countries. We're able to basically navigate through the supply chain and make recommendations to not only help them create efficiency, streamline the process, and reduce cost, more importantly, help them become more profitable. And as Tiffany said, educate them through the supply chain model. And we'll talk more about that during the webinar. Great. Thank you, Sean. And next, we've got Carl Weaver. And Carl, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work at ITOS. So my name is Carl Weaver. My Chinese name is Wei Car. I'm a wireless market mobile device specialist for the Asia Pacific and greater China, India regions. I've been involved in uh, convergent PC telecom wireless sectors uh, for three decades. Um, I've lived half of my professional working career in greater China. Uh, and I'm here in Seattle now, landlocked. I'm supposed to be working uh, in Shanghai now, as a matter of fact, but uh, I didn't make it out. Um, and so I'm waiting to go there. My company, so I, I've also spent the past uh, decade plus um, enabling near field communications, the trusted execution environment for mobile device security, eSIM, and when uh, we were acquired with uh, by ARM, ISIM, ESIM and ISIM, dual roots of trust security uh, with a company called Rivets, and now I'm with ITOS. We're doing something extremely cool. We're integrating the IoT with the blockchain by providing a uh, an SDK middleware framework that uh, enables the IoT module to directly and concurrently interface with the blockchain to provide uh, trusted identity authentication data. Uh, privacy protection. This is very, very cool, cutting edge technology. We're the only company in the world doing this. That's a pitch for the Telet guy and the ex Ericsson guy sitting in sitting here today. Well, it's thank you, Carl. Pitch. The subtle pitch. I love it. Subtle. Thank you so much for subtle. joining us. Yeah. I can't wait to get into the details <laughs> before it. That's be where out. the future is. I agree. Yes, and so next we've got Moose Lukmani from Telet. Moose, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, hi there. Hi, Tiffany. Um, uh, thanks for inviting me on this. I, I think we are, we, I know Tiffany and her team from uh, about uh, some years while we are working on IoT. And um, presently, I, I work on the 5G sales for devices. Um, uh, previously, I was with Qualcomm um, and uh, Cricket AT&T, uh, Sequon. Um, what I do is uh, focus on launching some uh, new 5G products uh, uh, in the next two quarters in the US and abroad, and then uh, take it to high power millimeter wave. So uh, that's my expertise, uh, devices on 5G. Nice to be here. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. All right, let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. So in our panel discussion on our webinar, Telecom Predictions for the Future of 5G, uh, we're going to talk about what 5G is, how it works, the pros and cons, and our predictions. So to get things started, let's just jump right into what is 5G? Everyone's talking about it from you know, the TV to uh, at the the stores, if you are out shopping, I mean, it's, it's different days we're living in, but, you know, nonetheless, 5G is an advanced wireless technology, and it is the fifth generation of cellular networks. Sean, why don't you open it up and give us just a few points of what 5G is? Great, Tiffany. Um, what I see is uh, 5G is really a network that is not only going to rally massively on towers, but cell technology of data transmission. So 
what's going to happen is we're going to be able to get information at a very much faster speed. For example, um, could you imagine having images in Netflix and different things that what normally would have taken maybe, you know, 10 minutes, half hour to have it done in a matter of uh, seconds? So with 5G, you know, we have 4G, which, 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 which was great. But not only with technology, I think data transmission, things are going to be delivered at a lot quicker speed. And as a result, I can just tell you one of my customers, um, they had increase in capacity of getting stuff from 350 locations, which took three or four days on 3G. When they got 4G, it took only a few days. So I can only imagine what happens now with 5G, how more efficient companies are going to be by simply getting information at a quicker speed, which result in them becoming more profitable. Okay, well, thank you, Sean. And Patrick, can you tell us a little bit about what 5G is from your perspective? So from my perspective, having seen all the Gs being deployed, I think is that 5G is truly an innovation platform that enables you not only to, like the other Gs from 1G to 4G, was focused on connecting people. Uh, 5G is really specific to that you can have a dedicated network spun up, dedicated for certain use case. So it's actually more for connecting machines and enabling new use cases. So it's, it's very unique in that sense. So if you need a sensor network that has very low power consumptions, next generation, um, chipsets that enables 10 years battery life with extreme coverage or you need massive throughput and very low delay or latency uh, to operate the remote mining equipment you can do that in the same network and that's what's so unique with 5g to me okay excellent well thank you so much patrick and next let's take a look at the generations we said this was the fifth generation well there's been several first there was 1G, which was analog, and then, you know, it progressed and it went to 2G, which was digital, and it was also the introduction of SMS. And then in three, there was 3G, and then it introduced packet switching and UMTS, and then 4G, you know, we've got the streaming era, and 5G is the Internet of Things era. So in, to tell us a little bit more, Moose, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've seen as the generations have changed? Not uh, sure. So I think uh, this is interesting to hear from Sean and Patrick on, uh, you know, what it does mean different things for different people. Uh, what I see in uh, terms of generations is uh, uh, from from the sales perspective, right? Uh, every generation adds value. Uh, and uh, when you go 100 times above the present speeds, you move to the next generation. So I think with 5G, we are reaching about, say, 10 gigabits. Uh, if uh, a technology evolves, which can reach, uh, say, 100 gigabits, that's going to be 6G. So, so every time we, uh, 10 times the speed, we are reaching a next generation is what I see. Usually that's happening in 2G, 3G, 4G, and 5G now. Um, and, uh, and when you add speeds, you also add features. So like the you know, faster connection speeds, things like that. So uh, this, this is an evolving game. I think uh, the industry is going to move to different generations uh, with different uh, means, um, you know, new radio, LTE, um, GSM. Uh, to higher speeds and uh, better features. And that's what everybody has to catch up to, including the network and the devices. So, yep, uh, you, we, as soon as we finish the discussion on 5G and launch devices, I'm sure we'll be discussing 6G. <laughs> I think they're already discussing 6G, to be Probably. quite honest. I see Carl nodding his head. Carl, what do you think about that? <laughs> yes, absolutely there. Um, Samsung and, um, and the Chinese... Um, vendors, Huawei, are already planning some kind of 6G um, uh, roadmap uh, through the ITSI, the International Telecommunications Organization there. So well, the funny thing is, is that 5G hasn't really... Oh, 5G will bring us the, the connection speeds that we need so that this does not happen. No. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I find that um, that um, we haven't fulfilled the dream of the use cases even for 4G yet. We really haven't. 
And so to me, I've been in the wireless industry for a very, very long time. And to me, this just adds hype. I won't call it fake news. I'll just call it hype because until you fully implemented uh, the usage of the 4G and then 5G, it's 6G is so far away right now. It's um, yeah, it's uh, it's in the clouds right now. I, I'm, yeah, that's what I, that's how I feel. All right, and Sean, I know you had a few things to say as you've been in the telecom industry for quite some time. Yeah, I think that you know, with regard to 5G, that I'll just bring up a, a case study with one of my clients is that. They had over 350 locations between Canada and the U.S., and they were basically a fast food chain restaurants. So the biggest challenge was getting the financial data back to the hub, a corporate, so that the financials could be done every day in a timely fashion. And so when they got 4G, things were getting done a little quicker, as we all said, because transmission speeds were happening a lot faster. So they went from getting financials out from a week to maybe getting this stuff every three or four days with 4G. And that was a great, like, you know, roadblock to overcome. And now with 5G, as things are going to be able to get transmitted at a quicker speed, companies are going to be more efficient because things are going to need to be done more promptly. And not only financial reporting will be get done, but as Carl and I said, if you have a farmer out in the field having to communicate back to someone inside the, inside the office, things are going to not only get done quicker, but more efficiently, and processes will be a lot more cleaner. So I can only imagine what's going to happen when 5G is actually laid out and what happens with 6G. So as every G gets laid out, things become you know, faster and faster, and I think as society it's going to change and while we'll, you know be on a different playing field the the real the real key is the ability to monetize the data and if you cannot monetize the data um this is what operators really want from 5g remember 5g 5g smartphones they're tools to make money by the operator that's what they are so they need to monetize and the way to monetize that uh, higher latency, uh, sorry, lower latency, higher bandwidth speeds is by monetizing the data coming from uh, the utilization of all these devices. That's a real key. All right, great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your comments on that. And next, let's talk about speed. How fast is 5G? Well, if you think about how long it takes to download a two hour movie, with 3G, it took 26 hours for a two hour movie. 4G, six minutes. I mean, six minutes is six minutes, but with 5G, 3.6 seconds. I mean, it'll be 3.6 seconds, a whole two-hour movie. Wow. So, Patrick, tell us a little bit about what you see as far as the maximum theoretical downlink speed and maybe some other examples. Well, actually, what I find remarkable having lived the other Gs and uh, particularly from a deployment perspective in Connect 5G we do everything from 5G all the way down to 2G including CBRS and actually 5G works. I thought when we started integrating 5G it would be like in the early days of 4G or 3G it actually didn't work. It had a lot of teething problems. But what I think is unique with this G is actually there was a multitude of devices. I think there are 55 devices right now launched as, and another 180 form factors. And that was the key to actually being able to test out the networks. And it, it actually works. Now, I'll, I'll get back to a bit more on what I think could be interesting use cases. But I, I wouldn't add so much to this picture. So that's it okay. actually all right. Well, Moose, I know you work in sales for Tellit, so why don't you tell us a little bit about how you approach the concept and the conversation of how fast 5G is? So, yep. So, so I think your chart looks pretty good. I mean, you know, with 5G, we are getting higher speeds. But uh, I'd like to point out here what uh, Carl mentioned on, you know, how does the network um, monetize this? Where well, we've heard some carrier data rate plans on 5G, which are uh, which are not sustainable in uh, in the future. 
um, you know, it's gigabits of data getting downloaded on the network. And the network is uh, pretty empty right now. But uh, once it gets loaded up, like the present 4G or 3G networks, how do they how do they charge people for it? Um, so yep, that I think that's that's a whole other thing that needs to evolve. On on the device side, yes, the speeds are fast. Uh, new use cases need to be developed. Uh, so what we see right now is more uh, just smartphones and um, uh, high data rate uh, fixed wireless equipment that's going to take off. And then we see how does 5G come into IoT. We get, which are sensors and things like that. Do they need these kind of data rates? They probably don't. So what do we do there? So, so, yep. so, so that, that's a good point. That That's probably what I would add to this picture is that the 5G network also in, enables very low speed. You can use very little resources and optimize it for really good coverage. And you can optimize it to get like 10 years battery life out of sensors. And we mentioned, I heard eSIM and iSIM being mentioned a bit earlier. Up until recently, the biggest power consumption in uh, in a in chip and or in a device has been the traditional physical SIM card. But now you add an eSIM or an iSIM, now you can extend the battery life. And because of the smartness of 5G, you can actually make a dedicated network which transmits the same signal many times. So you get huge coverage. So it sort of supports the 14 billion connected devices to 55 billion devices by 2025. So I think that's an important aspect of of the speed of 5G or ability. Of 5G. Yeah, ability. I think that's a very good point. We always talk about speed, but there are a lot of other aspects. Yeah. So that's yeah. And no, just, for, just for the record, the source of this chart was the GSMA, who I find to be very accurate in their findings. And I did have a the whole the whole conversation of how fast 5G is led to a very interesting discussion with a gentleman from Egypt this week. So I know it's a controversial topic. <laughs> yeah, but it looks yeah. yeah. Let's go ahead and skip over to the next. Let's talk about spectrum. So in order for these networks to work, we need spectrum. And the chart that you're seeing on the screen is showing by carrier how they're using the low, mid, and high bands. Patrick, would you want to walk us through this and explain in detail exactly what we're seeing here on this chart? Sure, I, I'll do my best. Um, okay. I think if we, if we look at the United States, I think it's pretty unique because we have both the low band, the, the mid band and the high band. So for those of you that are not RF designers or cell planners, let's put on some RF glasses. And the RF glasses in the low band, we're talking about half a meter type of wavelength. And with RF glasses of around 600, 700, 800 megahertz, you will be able to see around corners, you can see into buildings, you can see even around some, some mountains and through woods and forests. Um, so it's really good to create the coverage. Then you have the mid band, and now you're getting into the 1.8 to 3.5 gigahertz. And if you put on the RF clauses then, because water resonates around 2.5 gigahertz, now you're starting to get into a situation in which if it rains or you have a lot of leaves in the way, the coverage becomes smaller. You can see around corners, you can somewhat see inside buildings, but it's starting to be hampering. Um, the wavelength is in the centimeter, let's call it centimeter wave. And then you look at the high bands, and high bands um, is very, it's like 10 millimeters, it's um, 0 0.5 inches is the wavelength. It's in essence almost like it bounces on your skin and the way you get the way you get coverage is in essence what you can see. So now you can wear your normal glasses and see what would a uh, high band cover. Uh, there's one exception you can you you can also also reflect some and bounce off things to get a bit better coverage. The beauty of the high bands is that it's massive capacity, and you can in essence reuse the, the spectrum because it's so poor coverage. You can reuse that spectrum many times. So it really is the combination of coverage from low band, the the both throughput as well as as the the throughput and coverage of the mid band, and the, the high band is for really really high demanding services. And a you know Verizon was global first launching five G commercially in terms of fixed wireless, and you have many other firsts that are are coming. 
So would that be an explanation, uh, Tiffany? Yes, I think that that gets the point across. And I think Carl had something to add because we don't see T-Mobile on this uh, particular chart. But Carl, did you want to add anything? Yeah, here? the low band. Yeah, sorry. Oh, no problem. So, so basically, in a, in a nutshell, when you have megahertz and hundreds of megahertz, like, for example, six and 700 megahertz, which is what T-Mobile and the acquisition of Sprint uh, um, has right now for their 5G uh, initial rollout, because they've rolled out, right? The wavelength is um, shorter, and which means it's more powerful penetrating without refraction, reflection and refraction, those things. So actually, when you have 600, 700 megahertz wavelength, it can actually actually penetrate buildings better because it's sub, it's not the gigahertz range, it's, it's in hundreds of megahertz, 600 and 700 megahertz, which is Sprint and, um, and uh, T-Mobile right now. So there is a lot of value in that and I believe T-Mobile this week has officially announced the launch of their 5G network. Uh, I think on two smartphones, it's one uh, Chinese smartphone, one plus, and I think uh, Samsung's 5G smartphone. So there is value in sub gigahertz spectrum uh, de uh, deployment because of the ab ability to penetrate buildings, uh, concrete structures uh, and metal. It, it is, there is lots of value there. I'd like to add something here, Tiffany, is, uh, uh -huh. you know, on that slide, uh, which uh, Patrick and Carl commented, is uh, the low bands and the mid bands, they are getting complete, uh, always reformed. So they are all existing, being used for 3G and 4G. They will be reused for 5G. But the high bands are the ones that will add new value to the spectrum ecosystem, where, you know, you, you, you'll add new 5G bands. So that's going to yeah. happen very soon. Right, they're repos they're repositioning. In some countries, they've already taken out three G. Believe it or not, two uh, G is is pretty much gone in most countries, and uh, uh, and three G is now approaching that situation. So they can reuse the frequencies for those. And for anyone that doesn't know the technology telecom language, they call that sunsetting. So when one network is shut right. off, they call that sunsetting, and then when they're uh, reworking these networks, it's refarming. So a couple new keywords for everyone, some more golden nuggets in the conversation. And I'm interested in this one, especially because of my past experience with mobile IoT, but that's how I met Moose was over at the uh, GSMA event at, I believe it was CES uh, one of these years. And the GSMA does a really nice mobile IoT event where you're able to dive in really deep. And in fact, I've even gone to some developer sessions and thought I was a little in over my head, but you know, I went with it and I'm all the wiser for it. So with that, Carl, I know you've got a lot of experience in this arena. Uh, the 5G IoT can also be known as mobile IoT, and there's three pillars of it. There's the enhanced mobile broadband, and then there are the massive IoT applications as well as the critical communications. So the massive IoT are going to be smaller amounts of data that have low latency, but then the critical communications have ultra low latency. So it's near real time, and they're most likely an always on persistent connection. So with that, Carl? Yeah, I think Musk could also um, chime in with this because this is, I mean, Telet is a, is a cellular module vendor. But for IoT, actually, I feel, I feel that 5G's greatest value is utilization of IoT uh, for uh, connectivity of devices and robots. My CEO likes to use the term robots. Um, but in any, in any event, narrowband IoT is what we call it's a, it's a low 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 power wide area network and so is LTEM the difference being that LTEM also includes the addition uh to have voice um otherwise in the world today i think i think um Mus will will um will probably reiterate this that most of these cellular iot modules um actually they have multi mode factor which means they can combine Narrowband IoT and CAT M together, um, it's more expensive, obviously. But for some vendors, they may want the ability to switch uh, because narrowband IoT and LTM are 4G and 5G. So it's actually migrating to 5G. I know Telet has a 5G uh, MB IoT module that they've just recently introduced. Uh, I'm working with lots of the Chinese cellular iot module vendors and um i've talked to tell it as well um they're moving to 5g because that's the roadmap 
That's the roadmap for these cellular IoT module vendors. The cellular IoT module vendors are hoping to monetize 5G. Um, but in, in reality, it's a mixed bag because narrowband IoT, let's say in a place like China, 50% of all the narrowband IoT implementations in the world are coming from China and another 20% from Asia. Uh, and the rest would be North America and, and in Europe. Whereas LTEM, a lot of it is the United States. Now, um, Moss, you can verify if I've said that correctly or not. But when you look at who's using what, it seems to me that they, depending on the application that they're going to use, they may deploy one or the other, or they may want both uh, low power wide area. And that's really what IoT is all about, determining what you need now and what you might need in the future for low power and wide area when you're implementing these on these IoT devices, as well as gateways too, because these go into gateways as well. Yes, yes. modules. Yep. So I think uh, um, the thing I like I like to add and build on what uh, Carl mentioned is uh, when we talk of IoT and 5G, um, it uh, in the in the background it runs with uh, releases on 3GPP. You know what 5G 3GPP means is it's compliant with release 15. It could be running on the LTE radio or the new radio, but it's compliant with release 15. And then uh, when release 16 comes in and it becomes a a better 5G. Uh, all all these uh, technologies that are narrowband and LTEM can run on the new radio as well. That's that's what's going to happen in the background. But um, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I I at this point uh, the 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 five G that sells is the the enhanced broadband. But uh, in in a year, I think we'll see a uh, a lot of new radio capable IoT devices coming up. And Patrick, I know that you're connecting 5G with all these different integrations. Is the IoT connectivity something that you always also deal with? Oh, absolutely. Um, it, it's I, I agree with with uh, both Carl and Moose. This is the big, the really big. Well, a, one of the hugest big use cases for for me currently up until now. For example, for narrowband IoT. It's not been the network side that has been a limiting factor. It's actually been the devices that are available. And the, up until now, the generation of chips that, that's been out there has been too poor from a battery consumption perspective. But with the next generation coming out, as, as Moose just mentioned, we'll see much better sensors. And I, I really strongly believe that that will make it take off. Now, narrowband IoT will be very attractive to deploy in, to, for example, in real estate to, to check if there are leaks. You can, by doing that proactively, you can reduce your insurance rates with 25%, or you can use uh, much higher bandwidth applications and connect machinery and uh, remove the people from like a mining truck, uh, I mean, drill rig. So now you can actually blow the tunnels and immediately start working instead of waiting until people are allowed to go back in. There's, there's huge applications and it's, it's coming along. Yeah, that's industrial. But if you look at the consumer side, let's, let's not look at smartphones, tablets and smart watches. Let's look at connected cars because now the car will autonomously connect with another car and they'll actually be communicating with each other kind of yeah. like your two antennas yeah, in the, that's, the building that's very good use case yeah yeah so so Tiffany, you know what's interesting right now uh as i said 5g is actually working the issue we have really is more the modernization of 2g and um and you know how that coincides with 5g or 3g for that matter okay and then next uh, we've got this how it works. So we've got network slicing, beam forming, small cells, massive MIMO. Um, I know Moose, you were going to speak on this and Patrick as well. So Moose, why don't, you, why don't you start here and give us a walkthrough of how this setup works in relation to the picture and how all of these different terms kind of fit together. Although there are many more terms associated with five. These are just a few. Oh, sure. So I can put uh, this slide and comment on it. So. Um, Basically, uh, this, this shows the uh, areas in the network where you have a uh, millimeter wave coverage, and you have a uh, there is a lot of echo. Actually. So, 
and uh, and you see sub six coverage as well. So so there you go. Now it's much better. Um, so better. What, hap <laughs> what happens is a device is going to jump around between millimeter wave, sub six, and the existing LTE networks. So that that's the point that maybe I wanted to highlight on this slide here is uh, the devices of 5G will uh, will be jumping around between 5G, 4G, 3G networks, and it's going to be completely agnostic to the user. Um, the user will probably not even know which network he's on. At Sometimes he will be on 5G, sometimes he won't be. But the network is built out that way as it's seen on this picture. And Patrick, is there anything that you can add to this, especially on the topic of maybe network slicing? I know that that's a very hot topic when it comes to 5G. Sure. So, so network slicing is what I described a bit earlier. You can spin up a specific, let's call it end-to-end -end network for a specific use case, be it, you know, autonomous vehicles, be it a farming application, or you just adapt the whole network to what you really need. You don't overdo it from a resource perspective. You just optimize it to enable a business case and make it as, as um, economical as possible. What I think is fascinating here in this picture, if you remember the the um, RF glasses I spoke about in the early stage with millimeter wave, it's almost like it's so short wavelength that it's almost bouncing off the skin. It doesn't penetrate well. Um, to compensate for that, you use something called mass, ma MIMO, so massive input, massive output. So instead of traditionally in the previous Gs, at least up until three Gs, you had one transmitter antenna on the base station, which is in the middle, and you would have two receiving because the mobiles wouldn't be capable of, of doing much more. But then on the base station here, you can have, well, a common example now is you have 64 transmitters sending to the user equipment and 64 receivers that combines the, the signals to compensate for that poorer coverage. In addition, which we can't see in this pay, case, but you can do things with these antennas so you can direct the energy directly to Moose or to Carl and it doesn't spread the energy to all of us else. So you will have much, much better coverage than what you should have normally. So that's for me what's um, that's what's called beam forming in this. And yeah, when I was I, reading and watching some different videos, they compared the beam forming to a flashlight. So if you've ever yeah. had a fancier flashlight where you can right. adjust whether it's, you know, narrow or it's got this broad view, that's kind of the same concept. Exactly. You know, let's look at the antennas as we kind of continue this conversation. Yeah, right I, I looked at this. Um, I was actually involved in this technology 20 years ago with a uh, a startup uh, out of C out of um, Redmond called Metaway. People probably don't even remember. They had a terrible demise, but they came up with these beam steering. They called it beam steering technology uh, uh, for CDMA, and they were positioning them for the GSMN, uh, GSMA world. At that time, the only company company in the world that had them for their base stations was Nokia uh, of Finland. Um, but beam forming and beam steering technology has been around for at least 20 years, and now it's just maturing in, in its um, its realization. And the goal here really is when you have areas of coverage, um, like for example, at a, at a World Series, when you have areas of coverage where you need massive amounts of connectivity in a very short space, you steer the beam, you steer more energy for the beam into, a, into one specific cell area and you get, because you have higher um, capacity of users. So, um, beam forming, beam steering. In my mind, it's very, very similar, similar to each other. Pat, I don't know if you, if you'd agree with that. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. And also, I'd like to highlight this network slicing aspect, which uh, Tiffany mentioned. Uh, what, what this does is gives a, a, a QoS to each of these applications. So you can have your five G network, and you could say, you know, Netflix needs to run at this speed, and you could say uh, YouTube needs to run at this speed. And then the carriers can actually prioritize which applications run at which speed. And that's what that whole network slicing means. It, it's going to slice the network across from the carrier to the device based on applications, which is very interesting. Yeah, or, or if you do remote surgery, it's not a good thing if it starts yeah. lagging. Exactly. Right? You want to give it your best yeah. network, right? <laughs>
Yeah. So, yeah, it's five G. <laughs> well, it would have been a great carrier plug if we had a sponsor that was a carrier on here, but that's okay. Yeah. Uh, so but anyway, back to these antennas. We've got different forms of antennas. There's the yeah. macro towers, the clustered micro antennas. Which do you, um, any of you have any expertise in which antennas exactly would function for, for which use case? Sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll leave it to my colleagues if they want to speak about it. Um, I know no. this is kind of a surprise question, but it does kind of make sense, especially no, with the, so, the Vegas so, Strip is the example, and there's a lot of connectivity going on down there right now. Yeah, so maybe I'll use the picture. And, and so the micro antennas or what's called microcells or pico cells, you typically deploy where the traffic is. So we had the stadium being used as an example. So if you deploy a small, small antenna with quite low output power close to the people where you want it, you can handle and repeat that frequency and, re and massively increase the both coverage, but most importantly, um, capacity. If you look at the, um, the central facilities, what's very interesting with the latest technologies now is that they, you have a baseband where the digital conversion is done. And then let's call it the baseband hotel. Um, and then you just pull fibers out to the radio heads and now more and more you centralize that it's called central c round and then you distribute the, the radio antennas around the city uh, beam forming we spoke about then when it comes to the micro towers that typically you use to get the base coverage and make sure that it works everywhere but to boost or have better indoor coverage you use the different other antennas all right great next let's skip on over to figure out some of these 5G enhanced industries. So there is a list here, but there are so many more industries that 5G is going to be powering. So just to kind of give you a an example from manufacturing, we just had our global challenges in 2020 for the manufacturing industry webinar. And Sean Cook was one of our speakers on that where we talked about the different automation applications. But how could 5G be used for the supply chain, Sean? So with 5G, when we had the manufacturing uh, one of our colleagues has spoke about, you know, the use of uh, robots and how things can be done. And I recently saw something on the news of what they're using in restaurants. And uh, because of the pandemic is that, you know, now with technology is you have these robots going in and doing things that humans could be doing. Um, and they're actually getting done faster and probably for health reasons, because I'm a big health fan of doing a lot of work in the health industry, is that it's good for the virus and it's good for getting things done remotely where you don't have to have human interaction could reduce you know, issues with the food uh, because that's a big problem. But more importantly, with the robots, as they talked about in the manufacturing, that we're gonna see more and more of that to play a role in how things are getting done not only in manufacturing i do know in healthcare that how we're seeing 5g how that can happen and work out that things are just going to get done a lot quicker and yes having robots and things like that does take away from human interaction but i do see that as a positive thing especially uh, with doctors and doing telemedicine with health well, that will impact everything going forward. Well, I'm sorry for all of you out there that were looking to go into a career where you're flipping burgers. Now you've been replaced by a robot. Aye, aye, aye. All right. <laughs> next, <laughs> Let's go ahead and jump into some more use cases. So we've got the manufacturing use cases up here. We've got the health that we're talking about, energy and entertainment. Um, right along the same path with what Sean was saying about the remote surgeries, Virtual patient care is also becoming a very popular and practical solution during the pandemic for people to stay in communication with their doctors without exposing uh, anyone else to whatever they're ill with. So um, along those lines, we'll, we'll talk about that more during our Connected Health webinar that we're holding in September. And we're also doing one on the energy um, industry, which is very interesting as they go through their grid moder modernization and the smart grids that are being used for that. And there's many other applications too, but Patrick, can you tell me about one of your favorite use cases for 5G? 
Absolutely. I, I think I, I touched, I, I think 5G will enable a lot of the digitalization of assets. Um, so real estate is one of my favorites for sure. Um, Pre-pandemic, it was going full swing in modernizing and digitizing apartments. Now it's not that popular with uh, having people coming in and putting up sensors in the apartments or in the homes. Um, but clearly you can use the technology to detect if someone has higher temperatures. Um, one of the most popular use cases was to deploy sensors in buildings to detect two things really. One is to detect leaks early on in the United States. That was a huge business case in terms of you can reduce your insurance costs by 20, 25%. The other thing that you do in other parts of the world and in the parts of the US where electricity is, is expensive is to also monitor climate and all of those things to, in, to reduce the power consumption. So you can typically drive by applying the sensors combined with some AI and machine learning to optimize things, you can typically drive 25 plus percent in reduction of energy and that becomes large money. Um, the other thing which is interesting is in the buildings today to track sustainability impact. Today, mostly the building managers, they actually track it on Excel sheets and send, send it manually every month into the central point where they consolidated for the quarterly report. Now you can in essence have real time reporting on energy consumption and, and those parts. Um, oh, well, I was going to bring uh, up drone. It's being used for the energy sector. They're going out to monitor the power lines yeah. and the different pipelines via drone, yeah. which is kind of interesting. Musa, yeah. are there any other really cool use cases that you might want to mention? Um, I think uh, you, ha you have it all covered. I'd like to maybe uh, highlight on the entertainment side where, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, main on mainly on speed. So you would have a uh, gaming consoles like uh, you could name it Xbox, Sony. Uh, the, if, they, if you want to do real time gaming, uh, you know, you need these 5G speeds, um, AR, VR. So 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 in that sector, I, I feel there is there is a lot of uh, scope with the speed of 5G that's going to be useful. I and I think um, no matter what the industry, I think it's that everyone's pushing for this digital transformation of pretty much every industry. So it's kind of yeah. the overarching topic that just keeps coming up in no matter what the industry. I've got an interesting one here. Um, my CEO was telling me that in Shanghai now for AR VR, you can walk into this uh, shop. They sit you down in a quiet room and you put these AR VR glasses on and uh, they supply you with a drink um, and you're it's actually like you're going to the beach um, it, it, you've it's got the whole audio visual experience um, and I, I feel like wow this is to be a great thing if you're driving two hours in Seattle traffic you've got road rage it's it'll be a great thing to like stop by one of these places to kind of relax for an hour or two they actually physically have these shops in, in Shanghai where you can actually go in uh, if you if you don't if you've never been to Fiji and you want to go to Fiji you've never been to the Eiffel Tower uh, and you want a, a relaxing experience um, or maybe an exhilarating experience um, this is what ARVR is doing, and 5G only augments the ability for that. Um, these virtual glasses that people put on. This is a new industry that is being formed, and 5G uh, only enhances the uh, the wireless connectivity of the video that's being used for it. So it's it's an inter it's it is, I think, going to be big. Uh, I think movie studios need need to look at this very clearly. What's going on? So. Well, I don't recommend that you actually use the AR or VR glasses while you're driving or even sitting in traffic <laughs> unless you happen to be in an autonomous vehicle, which is coming. But, you know, please don't be doing that while you're driving. So uh, as we look at the 5G ecosystem here, we'll kind of just this is a my perspective, my overview. So I came up with this uh, diagram to kind of, you know, reflect what I'm thinking about that. So we've got the well carriers, the, M the MNOs, the MVNOs. Uh, there's the broadband cloud operators, the network operators, and the infrastructure and equipment that are kind of responsible for the network itself. But then there's the governing bodies that play their role. The hardware manufacturers are the OEMs, the component and chipset suppliers, 
And then there's the systems integrators like Patrick. And of course, you've got the AI, data analytics, edge computing, the IoT platforms, uh, software, SaaS. There's so many different people that come and, and businesses and ecosystems that kind of just collide to make 5G possible from storage and security and the emerging technologies, they're just getting started. So is there anything that one of you would like to add to this slide as far as I, I was going to ask Muse if since you're with Tellit and they have modules and they have connectivity, where would you fall on the ecosystem or would you say that you provide more than just those two areas? So I think uh, we fall into uh, modules and devices and uh, 5G connectivity is coming up. It's it's pretty new. At this point, uh, carriers are still uh, experimenting with what they will charge for these kind of data rates. Um, I've heard uh, I've heard numbers in gigabytes for a few dollars, which uh, which which is not going to be sustainable. So at at this point, uh, uh, 5G is uh, if you had a 5G smartphone right now on AT and T or Verizon. Uh, you're pretty much using at the same the same plan that you have for your 4G, um, but uh, <laughs> I don't know how this how this moves ahead with time. I think we'll know more about connectivity in the next few months. Right now, it's more about um, what this costs in terms of making these devices. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the next slides here. So, why 5G? You know, and and we're gonna get to why not 5G here in a second. So. I know we've got some questions in the audience that are waiting to be answered, but don't worry, your answers are coming. It does have its benefits to business, especially when you consider that it's elaborate, it's enabling the collaboration that's necessary for some organizations, especially as they're not able to join um, together live right now. So it is good for that as well as operational efficiency and more so to make data-driven decisions. And from an entertainment and end user standpoint, it's this personal custom experience that they're trying to drive. And without 5G, we would have you know low throughput, we'd have dropped calls, it would be slow download and upload times, and it's ultimately creating a balance. So it's a balance between the bandwidth, the network slicing, you know, all these things are forming together so that you can get optimum performance is what they're going for. You know, they want this ultra reliable super low latency network that we can, you know, use for many different applications. Is there anything else that you would like to add, Moose, since you've got customers that you're dealing with all the time? How do, how do you convince them on why 5G? I think uh, it's all the things we've talked for so far, you know, new, new applications, which would not run so well on 4G. That's the first, first driver. And um, secondly is uh, not being left out because the whole industry is gonna move to 5G. If, uh, if your competitor offers it and you don't have it, um, you will lose that business. Um, and uh, those are two big factors, getting new use cases and uh, and staying up with the with the general trend of being on 5G. And Patrick, from your perspective, you're the one integrating these networks. Is, is 5G making your life easier? And why would you say yes to 5G? Well, number one, it works, <laughs> which is great. Um, the other thing is the ability to have a dedicated network for a specific use case. And I, I think... If you look at McKinsey's, uh, they look at why 5G, they say two thirds of why 5G would be relating to cost, efficiency, and time to market. I like deploy 5G in factories, then you can remove all the Cat5 cables and you can redeploy a, a, a factory line very fast. One third would be the increased, um, increased revenues. Um, from an integration perspective, because you can configure things through software and adapt the network, if you use the other technologies you just had on the previous page, it also makes the whole network adapt and trigger automatic things. So in essence, what you can do, if you look in a farming perspective or in many industries, you can use 5G to remove labor and and people like in farming the machines are bigger and bigger but if you can have autonomous vehicles driving around the farm actually it's more efficient if they are smaller and uh, because you don't need to water everywhere you should water where it's needed you should fertilize where it's needed so it's better to send smaller machines with um, actually autonomous machines to where they are needed uh, so that drives a lot of efficiency and will increase the yield not least, but also sustainability, a big push for me. 
there are some who say if you have a private 5G network and you can lease private 5G networks, like Harvard University, you do not need Wi-Fi anymore. If you have a private Wi-Fi, a 5G network, you don't need Wi-Fi. It uh, Wi-Fi will have a short shelf life if 5G becomes leasable as a private network to say organizations, companies, uh, universities, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very interesting concept. And, and, and Carl, I think you'd bring up a hugely interesting point. I'm, I'm personally very bullish on the, uh, the whole private LTE and then continuation of, of private 5G with the CBRS band being used, launched in the US, for example. So you can actually use that to deploy your own network. And then it becomes to answer one of the questions on the chat. Then it becomes very um, cost efficient because then you can combine what operators provide plus your own private LTE network. Possibly, so, po possibly public security bureau, public secu security, right? Fire, police, EMS. Possibly, possibly, yeah, possibly. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll add to what Patrick said. You know, the CBRS is very interesting. Uh, right now, it runs on LTE. Uh, I, I don't think the CBRS uh, consortium has moved to five G yet. But it, but it's it's supported. I mean, uh, you know, the devices support that band forty eight on five G, so it'll it'll be fine. Forty two and forty three in Europe. Yep. Yes. yes. All right. So why not five G? Well, ninety percent of the world is still using four G. So if it's not broke, don't fix it, right? No, I don't know, but maybe uh, it, it is working in ninety percent of the world. So we'll see what happens. And then we've got the uh, more towers are needed because the smaller cells, which is more costly for infrastructure and equipment. Plus, there's growing concerns about profit margins and the overcrowded bandwidth and 5G failover, which we'll get to, Sean. But I know that we're on a crunch for time. So I do want to throw out here, I know that there were a few comments in the thread here uh, with what, why all the hype in the media about 5G. So um, I do have a, a quick question here. So here, here's a FAQ question that they were asking the GSMA. So. I've read social media articles linking the spread of COVID-19 with 5G. Is this true? No. You can believe what you want. <laughs> no, the, the WHO states that there is no link between 5G and COVID-19, confirming that viruses cannot travel on radio waves and or mobile networks. The WHO maintains that COVID-19 is spread through respiratory droplets when an infected person coughs, sneezes, or speaks. What do you guys think about that? <laughs> Maybe only fake news travels through 5G. <laughs> I'm not joking. Well, how about, the, how about this one? How about it's this the timing. One? I think that's the only thing that's bad. 5G and COVID came pretty much at the same time. So. There, there, there's a health issue, though. There, there, there is a health issue with all wireless technologies. Um, it's not being addressed, um, and it should be addressed, at least rec acknowledged. Um, you don't want... It doesn't matter if it's 2G, 3G, 4G, 5G. You don't want a young child under the age of 15 to have a cell phone glued to the head because the, the brain is still forming and, and the, the, uh, the radiation that can emit, even from a regulated smartphone, and all smartphones uh, due to F FCC requirements have to have a SAR uh, specific absorption rating, rating, right, in the United States. Even with that said, there should be a limitation having a young child use uh, put the smartphone to the ear. This it should be, uh, it should be just like you can't smoke cigarette. You know, smoking cigarettes is is harmful. You can die. Well, I think if you have a smartphone for a child less than fifteen years old, especially an infant, I've seen infants. They're taking the phone. They're inquisitive. They're pu pushing the button. They can actually dial nine one one. Okay, it's it's a it's a health hazard. Don't let cell phones, don't let cell phones near children. That That's what I feel. Especially at a gas station. So here's our next question as we've, we've got on the screen right now, the different uh, associations and governing bodies that look over the standards compliance and EMF. So is 5G carcinogenic? So the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which reviews evidence for cancer hazards, classifies radio frequency signals in the same group as eating pickled vegetables. And that eating and to say that there was limited evidence it could cause cancer to humans, and more so, eating processed meats falls into a higher classification than radio signals. And the WHO says that the studies provide no indication 
that base station signals increase the risk of cancer or other diseases. So you can't believe everything that you hear. Um, how about how about one of these ones? Let's say is 5G dangerous to the environment? I I have seen the pictures on social where the birds are you know, well. The, uh, the question is, is it dangerous to the environment? This, and according to the GSMA, the same exposure limits that protect people also protect the environment. The responsible German government agency, Bundesamt <laughs> has stated that there is no scientifically reliable evidence of a risk to animals and plants exposed to radio signals at or below the limits of the ICNIRP international guidelines and that's listed here under the EMF monitoring. They're recognized by the WHO, and they just updated their 2020 guidelines. So it seems up to date. And it says that the Antenna Bureau in the Netherlands, shout out to Johannes, has also refuted conspiracy theorist claims that 5G tests have harmed birds. And one last one, the question is, there have been reports that link 5G interference with weather forecasting and potential consequences. Well, the technical studies conducted by the International Telecommunications Union confirm that 5G will not cause harm to any existing services, including weather forecasting with separation between weather forecasting spectrum and potential 5G spectrum, as, as well as reasonable power limits supported by most governments and mobile industry. 5G presents no risk to weather forecasting. So that's that's the skinny on that. So. Put, put your worries at ease. They've got the new 2020 guidelines. Seems they have the situation under control. Uh, next for predictions. Well, they said that the number of connected devices was going to be 50 billion by 2025, which I think since the lack of Mobile World Congress, I don't know that that's actually possible now. Um, my thoughts on it is we've reached, we've crossed the digital threshold and we've reached an unprecedented level of complexity. So when it comes to the number of connected devices, Patrick, what do you think it's going to be? 55 billion billion all right anybody any any takers how many connected devices by 2025 all right well we'll see when we get to 2025 yep next <laughs> let's let's have a follow-up seminar to finish i'm just doing it for the sake of time we're gonna we're gonna get through the rest of these slides here rest of the content so who is winning the race to 5g According to analysis, Mason, it's China, followed by South Korea and the U.S. And since you're all the way across the world, Patrick, is this accurate from your perspective? I think China is in the lead from a mid-band perspective, and they have done massive rollouts. So I would say, as of right now, I would agree with that. Northeast Asia, South Korea, and Japan. But what's what one never should underestimate is the force and the power of U.S. when you decide to do something. And I think we have decided to do something. We have low bands, mid bands, and high bands being rolled out. Um, so I, I think uh, if the U.S. really continues on wh what I can see right now, I believe we will start uh, catching up shortly. And Carl, I know that you're big on going to Mobile World Car Congress in Barcelona and know the significance and importance of that show happening every year where they come together to, you know, steer the committees for who's making the standards and what's going to happen and making all this new technology available. How important was that show and is that affecting who's winning the race to 5G? I think that show was critical for the for the GSMA, actually, because they had a virtual show. Uh, they have three shows a year. They had a virtual show in Shanghai in uh, in late June. I was actually uh, invited to that event. Uh, to uh, I was interviewed for that event. The show in in Los Angeles, in my opinion, not very good. Uh, it may or may not be online again. These online shows for such a thing like that, it it doesn't work. Um, they've been unfortunately because it's a great organization. They've been the loser in this. Um, the winner was the CES show, obviously, because they were unaffected in January. They had a show in Shanghai, but that was uh, not as big as the show every January. And it looks like January they're going to have the show again. So it looks to me as though, um, unfortunately, COVID-19 has had a, has played a huge impact. And when you're in this industry, you need to, it's a touchy-feely industry in many situations. You need to be talking to people, getting feedback, seeing new devices, and we're frozen again. Where's the 5G when you need it? Yeah. 
Right. And my, from my perspective, I think it's South Korea that's winning uh, across the bands. If we see all the bands, I think that country is ahead and uh, U.S. is going to be there this year. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and skip yeah. to the next slide for the sake of time here. Um, we've got expectations changing. So this is from a report from, and I understand if anyone would have to leave because I, we were scheduled to be done uh, about right now, but we're going to keep going to get through this content because we've got a great presentation to share with you. So if you do have to leave, I understand, but if you want to stay, then we're glad to have you. So uh, this particular slide is depicting the telecom and technology as well as the media 2020 predictions from Deloitte. And they were, for the first time in history, forced to republish their report uh, midway through the year because of so many changes. And so there was a decline in the number of smartphones they were expecting for sales in 2020. There was an increase in CDN, which is content content distributed and net defined net networking, but it's, it's all about the content there. And there's an increase in the number of 5G trials and pilots. An increase, not by a little, but from 100 plus to 1,000 plus 5G trials. And the drivers for change, well, it's COVID-19, the lockdown, supply chain disruption, Sean, and economic contraction, as well as the changes in consumer behavior. Because let's face it, when we're forced to work from home and we're put on lockdown, our consumer buying habits are going to change. So how is this affecting the supply chain from your perspective, Sean? Well, good question is we will have an allocation uh, model here going on, not just with PPE, but just in general. And for people that don't know what allocation hold is, is for example, if a facility is ordering up uh, 300 masks per month or 300 gallons, um, the vendor might say to you, allocation is going to be 150. So anything above 150, we are not as McKesson Medline going to be able to provide to you. So if you don't have another through the supply chain, two or three vendors, uh, you're not going to be able to either do the surgery or you're not going to be able to get the office supplies. Or you're just not going to complete the job that you need to get done because you don't have the proper PPE or um, supplies in store to be able to fulfill the job. So my recommendation to get through this allocation supply chain is have multiple vendors with the same industry of the equipment or product that you're getting until um, we get through this uh, pandemic. And even after that, I do see that the supply chain is going to be interrupted. So my recommendation is to have multiple vendors within a sector so you don't have a disaster. Thank you, Sean. So the boat is something that you jump on. The boat means the blockchain of AI things. And the reason why we say that is because cellular IoT modules are going to drive all machines and so-called robots of the future. But they will have an AI uh, or an artificial intelligence um, feature or component to them. We don't make the AI. The AI, as uh, Moss will tell you, is actually going to be built in to the cellular IoT modules and it's going to be done at the edge so that it can better refine the raw data. It can better refine the data that's pretty pretty raw when it comes from the sensors on that particular cellular IoT module in that particular IoT device. Uh, and it's at the edge sitting out there before it reaches the cloud. So what we've done is create a framework um, for it's an SDK middleware that embeds in. And uh, Carl, whenever your uh, connectivity is is back at back at full throttle, uh, we do have a, a question IoT regarding device. the battery consumption. Is is Boat a solution for battery consumption for five G? No, Boat is is just. Does it a have any effect on battery? Um, no, it is just a middleware software that allows the data to concurrently run on the blockchain for for trust to trust the data that's what it is okay and so blockchain is a distributed ledger so it makes sense especially when you're shipping things in and out of the country that you would be able to have this digital log of when it was received 
And so tell us about your blockchain module and how that relates to your boat solution. Carl. Okay, so boat, boat or blockchain of AI things is what we call an SDK, software development kit. It's software middleware. It's a software middleware framework. It is actually an SDK which is embedded into the cellular IoT module. Let's say of tell it, it would be embedded into the cellular IoT module. It would it would help the uh, the taking of the raw data, and when it goes into the cloud, it can currently through the cloud go into the blockchain because the blockchain is an overlay to the Internet of Things. But when the IoT device is at the edge, it needs to first get into the cloud. We allow it to concurrently get into the blockchain at the same time. So it's concurrently happening. And the IoT server, there's a sort of an IoT server server um, collecting the data from the cloud, but they can also collect the data from the blockchain to determine that the data is real because when data is written into the blockchain, it's written as a hash in a block and it's constantly being written as the data is being sent from the module into the cloud um, and and to the end use and end use and usage of it so we're just attestating that the data that's being sent is real it's being sent it's being continuously sent directly sent we have uh, um, trusted De, uh, trusted IoT authentication, that's one thing, and data preserving protection. So we're protecting the data on these IoT devices because they can be hacked. So we do that by protecting the secure enclave when the data comes in from the sensors. We're actually we're actually able to protect the secure enclave. In this case, you might call it a, an eSIM or an iSIM for all of these modules. They will all have either an eSIM or, or an iSIM for these cellular IoT modules. We allow the data to pass through protected. That's basically it before it reaches the blockchain. Yep, I, I can attest to that. That's correct. So eSIM and iSIM will be supported in the new devices. And uh, uh, what Carl mentioned, uh, I mean, I'm taking a step back, you know, what is a blockchain? Maybe it's, it's, it's just a link to secure your data. And then when, uh, when a device enters that blockchain, uh, you verify that device and that becomes part of that link. Um, without that link, if it's not a trusted device, uh, there are your, that link won't be complete, and your day, your encryption is going to fail. Right. So, so, so I think uh, it's 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 a good concept. It's coming soon, and and it's needed when you know your number of devices exponentially increase because of who do you trust at that point? Well, it's it's here. We've we've enabled it on nine Chinese cellular IoT module vendors. We want it to be on Telex devices, but that's another ball game. We can talk about that later. Um, the real key about this technology is, you said it correctly, blockchain allows the data to be trusted. That's the major thing that it does, allow the data to be trusted. Uh, and in the industry now, you know, cellular IoT is not a new concept. It's been around since 3G, 4G, and it's going into 5G. It's been around for about 20 years. There are about 300 million uh, module vendors, uh, sorry, 300 million modules that were um, deployed into the market in 2019. There are essentially 10 manufacturers, 10 major manufacturers. Talit is one of the top manufacturers um, and 90%, uh, pretty much 10 vendors share 90% of this ecosystem. So it's a bit fragmented, but it is, uh, it is a small, it's a small ball game here. Um, the cellular IoT module is like a cell phone for a robot. So if, as you can see the slide there, what, I'm, what we're trying to say is machines will use their own wireless connectivity. Machines will use these cellular IoT modules and they will be communicating between each other. That is part of the, the future of autonomous vehicles, of the sharing. Well, we are we are at a, a, a pause here. So, is there anything that you'd like to add, Patrick, as, as yeah, far as yeah. using blockchain and some of your integrations? Re really? No, I, I'm I uh, I really believe where if you use five G as an innovation platform, or in this case, um, IoT, any type of cellular or 
and you combine that with blockchain, which is an immutable ledger, uh, it's really a trusted ledger. You don't need to have a specific entity that you don't need an intermediate or central point that keeps the data. It's automatically logged on a um, on an immutable ledger. And there are public blockchains like Ethereum or its private blockchains. But the whole purpose is that no one can manipulate it. Once it's logged, it's there. And it's hugely advantageous in the uh, in the overall supply chain, in my mind. So the combination of the things that Carl is presenting is very, um, very attractive. Don't know about your solution, but definitely the use case is, is tremendous. Back to you, Carl. You were, you were frozen, so I was just making the making sure the audience was entertained go right ahead carl thank you for rescuing rescuing me from cyberspace <laughs> no problem. Okay, next slide all right and so walk so, us through this slide this is for all yeah. you tech lovers out there so it's full of information we'll send out the slide deck after the after the event go ahead carl so we support all these all of these trusted trusted services with various public and, pri and private blockchains, we have, it's a framework that we supply, okay? It's actually a framework we supply. So that means we have a management part of it as well. And uh, we're working with, as I said, nine cellular IoT module vendors, and I would not be a real good sales guy if I didn't say we're trying to get Telit on board, um, if anybody from Telit is listening. Um, and then finally, and then, and then finally, I'm not, I'm not, bashful in any way and then finally actually all of the technology on cellular iot modules is based on the baseband chips and so we work with qualcomm we work with mediatek we work with um uh, high silicon which is huawei's vendor and there's another new chinese um SOC, another new chinese uh, baseband chip vendor baseband chips have the have the modem which is needed for the cellular iot modules Cellular IoT modules are a combination of things put together to create a unique thing for these IoT devices. But the baseband comes from traditional semiconductor chip companies like Qualcomm, MediaTek, and the various other companies. And we're working with all of them as well. That's basically, so we have the whole ecosystem uh, under wraps here. And um, yeah, I'm hoping that people recognize that these modules are going to play a huge role in the future. So it's great job, Security Moss. <laughs> and you talk about the future. Well, what's in the future for 5G? We've got emerging technologies, big data, machine learning, open RAN, eSIM, iSIM, simple IoT, smart drones. I mean, the future is here. And it seems like this technology is just now being utilized, but that it's been around for a while. So with that in mind, we'll we'll kind of circle back to this in our final slide because I see that some questions are coming in and I want to be able to answer those too. So go ahead and skip to the next one. And so how do you prepare for 5G? And so I've prepared like a very nice outlook for different opportunities that you could like cash in on as well as things to be mindful of. And one of the things coming up in the chat is that the overcrowded bandwidth of everything would be moved to one single band, which would be 5G. Sean, tell us about the 5G failover. Audio, Sean, you're, mute, you're muted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so with 5G failover, it's really interesting. I'll just use uh, Comcast as a, an example, is that most companies like the cable companies, they do have in their system failover so if their network does go down that is failing over to another you know network backup um, and what was mentioned earlier in the call in the webinar today someone had mentioned that you know with connectivity that if you're on one network most of the time it will fail over to another network so many clients would not even know that if the network went down so companies that do have a reduction in a row, well, with 4G failover, 5G failover, will go ahead and their network will fail over to another network and the customers won't even know. So we just have to be mindful that, you know, for me as an example, I'd never have just Comcast as a internet provider. I'd have another major carrier. So if something did happen, for example, in the Comcast network, 
that you would fail over and your interruption of delivering services to people would not go down. Why? Because it's going to fail over to another network or you have another carrier out there. So just be prepared to have redundancy. We've talked about that is if you're not redundant with the network and it goes down, then you're going to be out of service. So just keep that in mind. Back up your supply chains and back up your connectivity is the underlying message there. And so I do have another tip for you. As I was looking at which industries were going to have the most opportunity with 5G, I found this nice little, uh, uh, I guess it's a statistic or a forecasted statistic from Gartner. And it says that the share of 5G connected cars actively connected to a 5G service will grow from 15% this year to 74% in 2023. But wait, there's more, 94% by 2028. So there's an opportunity for you to cash in on. And by then the CV2X will enable the exchange of messages within and between vehicles, infrastructure, pedestrians, cyclists, and the environment. Connected cars will be faster, safer, and more efficient. Are there any other opportunities or things to be mindful of? And we'll just kind of go down the row here. Moose, starting with you, that you could give us a tip for the audience. I think, uh, no, you've, you've captured it all. I think um, uh, automobile is a very interesting use case. You know, all these connected cars have a lot of data to send and, and it's very critical data. You know, it's it's trying to drive uh, by itself. So, so um, getting uh, 5G into these cars is very critical. Uh, that That's one space where 4G will not work. If, if you had to move, then this is a driver. Okay, and Carl, what about you as far as opportunities or things to be mindful of? So it's great to have 5G, and I agree, but it's great to have 5G in the autonomous vehicle. But the autonomous, autonomous vehicle brings on something we call the sharing economy. Please be aware that the sharing economy is a, is a consensus situation where insurance companies, module vendors like Telit, um, banks, and uh, IoT device vendors, they all consolidate on sharing of the data and resources. It all makes sense in the sharing economy, uh, and it has to make sense, especially for autonomous vehicles, um, that all the data for the life and the health of these devices is shared, and then it's the data is trusted. So that's very, very important for the future. The sharing economy is coming. Please be aware of it. Okay, and Patrick, I'm gonna pass it to you with a question. So is data compression and compaction still useful for 5G? Since you're the integrator, I figured you'd be a good person to answer this. Is, is data compression and? Uh, data compression and compaction. Absolutely, okay. yeah, no, it's, it's still useful. Anything that saves resources and make it more efficient, it is, uh, it's very much uh, needed. I think uh, what's um, um, if if I no so that's the answer to that question. Did you want me to comment on how to prepare? Yes, please. Okay, I, I think if I take a step back and I look at what I would say to anyone that starts off, be it a business or a mobile network operator, is is really to start. Start already now. Even if you don't have 4G, you should start trialing the business cases and use cases. There are many use cases in which you can use alternative access technologies could be could be LTE, but it could also be um, LoRa if you want to do long long range sensors just to start trialing out what makes sense. It's very clear from the previous G's that the first mover advantage first mover advantage of being a front runner. If you say that one fifth of the companies are a front runner, they have a CAGR of growth of 8.5%, whereas the other 80% that has not moved, and they are laggers and followers, they have an average growth rate of negative 1.5%. So then you can see the importance of starting now, and also the importance of that would be highlighted with that the predictions now is that what took a year in 4G and the rate of innovation in 4G in a year is now going to be compacted into a quarter. So you can see that it will never move as slowly as it does today and it will only accelerate going forward. So 
that's the only advice I would have is, is start now and get your sales organization adapted to the new vertical you're going after and that isn't being enabled. And so before we get to Sean, where he's going to tell us more about his solution spotlight, I'm going to give you my prediction for what I think is going to happen with 5G. I think that as far as what I'm reading, the enterprise level companies, they're counting on these advanced wireless technologies to take their business to the next level. And if you're going to wait and fall behind the digital curve, don't. Just like Patrick said, start now, but start simple and start practical because the last thing you want to do is jump into a critical communication nightmare where you are in over your head and you don't even know how to interpret the data that you're receiving. I think starting with small practical steps towards towards digital transformation and just start incorporating some of these different technologies or and just really do your homework and, and make sure that you have an alternative solution in place in case, God forbid, that the company that you would choose to have as your solution would, let's say their parent company goes bankrupt. These things happen. So make sure that you have a second solution in mind so that you can thoroughly be prepared to make the most of 5G. And so next, Sean, let's talk supply chain. He's got a free audit opportunity for you to be able to save by submitting your P&Ls. Let's hear about it, Sean. Yes, thank you, Tiffany. So if anybody wants a free cost savings analysis and actually learn how perhaps you can reduce your cost and get your 5G network paid for by having us look at your P&L statement. You can just go ahead and go to grouppurchaseandresources.com, go to contact us, complete the information, and one of our associates will get back to you. And you know, this is a free audit, so we're gonna let you know, not only through supply chain, but many different ways of how you can create efficiency, streamline the process, reduce costs, become more profitable. More, more importantly, as Tiffany said, understand that supply chain management and not get caught um, off guard. And uh, you'd be surprised the amount of money we could potentially save you. And all of a sudden your 5G network could be paid for by us assisting you. And that's our offer. And that's for services as well. So if you're interested to learn more, you can visit his website or you can also visit the landing page on IoT Marketing's website, iotmktg.com uh, slash webinars or slash this actual landing page for this event. And there's also a link there that you can submit your p &L. So next, let's go ahead and take a look at our upcoming webinars. We've got the Connected Solutions for the Power Industry webinar on August 20th. And then we have the Smart Solutions for Connected Health on September 24th. Very interesting what's happening there. And also the Simple IoT for Smart Cities in October. And then being mindful of holiday travel, if we're able to travel, right? So December 10th, we'll have the Solution Spotlight Showcase, where if you have a solution that you would like to show off and promote, then this is a great opportunity for you. We're still looking for speakers and sponsors for all of these upcoming events. So by all means, contact us, uh, leave a message to us in the comment thread, and we would love to hear back from you and have you also attend one of our future webinars. So without further ado, let's go ahead and cut to the questions and answers. Uh, but first, a quick message from our producers, IoT Marketing. And thank you again to Johanna Speakman and Cynthia Baker. Um, our website's listed. You, we've got our email contact there. You're also going to get a copy of the slide deck. There's our Facebook page, our, our Twitter page, and LinkedIn to keep you connected as we you know, get through these times together with connected solutions. So we'll keep you connected. And for the first question we have, has anyone heard about Adam, the Atom Beam solution and do you have any comments about it? Anyone? Yeah. Okay, well, I have heard of Atom Beam and that's actually a client of our, um, our company, IoT Marketing. And so I have heard about that. And some other questions were regarding what are your thoughts on 4G being phased out and when will it when will 5G fully replace 5 4G 5G replace 4G? Any takers? Patrick, thoughts? Uh, 15 years. 
I, I think the thing is, I, I think the technologies will coexist, right? We we still had two G in the United States, despite deploying five G. So yeah. I think they will coexist. Um, I think now with the, the the new generations, they are coexisting more. They're using the same bands, they're using the same digital units, and so forth. So I think um, yeah, it's a very long time before they replace each other. Yeah, I was looking at some different statistics and it was saying as, as long as 2025 or longer that 4G will still yeah. be out there. So I think, you know, I know personally I've got the iPhone 11 Pro and it works 4G and 5G. Hello? So they are expecting that in November of this year that the iPhone will release a version of its iPhone. Uh, Apple will release the iPhone as two different uh, 5G formats and then it'll go to a single version after that. So. It's yet to be developed. It's a, it's, it's a work in progress. And then other questions. How could yeah, I... Um, go ahead. Well, I think it's very, very interesting that people don't realize that so much money was allocated for 5G amongst the three major operators. Their, um, their CapEx has been maxed out. And there were some people in the U.S. government who said, why don't you just have one 5G network and everybody use it? Um, that didn't work out, but you know these these networks. You have to uh, have your return on investment. That's been tremendous amounts of money invested in these networks. It is going to take a long time to return or recoup the investment in these existing five G networks. So, Lord knows they have to find creative ways to sell five G spectrum. I mean, to sell five G um, usage to all kinds of ecosystems. It's very important. And there were a couple more questions, but I think we've already addressed most of them. Could bandwidth utilization be a challenge for 5G? Well, that's why Sean's recommending that you back up your connectivity and back up your supply chains, because, you know, if they're all on one band, then there there are all these advancements with band, you know, band mitigation. But uh, is, Moose, are you still on here? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I, I, okay. have, yeah, I ran out of battery. <laughs> That, that's okay. Um, but how do you feel about that? The topic of five G bandwidth utilization. Do you yes, think that so think they've? It's it's a fair question. I think uh, you know, like like I mentioned before, the 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 bandwidth on five G right now is completely open. All these new bands, you know, it's uh, hundred megahertz, uh, two hundred, eight hundred megahertz bands. Uh, a lot of uh, available spectrum. But as this moves ahead, and there are more and more devices coming on five G. Uh, the true picture of, uh, you know, what speeds and what it's going to cost is going to evolve. So if you take it from the aspect that we definitely will be spectrum challenged also with 5G for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at mission critical applications, though, within 5G, you can dedicate the network slice that guarantees that you will have the quality needed. And that's why, like, in a factory... Uh, you can't really use Wi-Fi or, or networks where you cannot guarantee the quality of service, whereas in 5G, you can do that. So it helps, and I agree with all the speakers so far. And nobody, and nobody, that and Pat, Pat, nobody even talked about the security aspect of 5G compared to Wi-Fi. Correct. Yeah, no, it, and it's tremendously better, at least. And we're not bringing in Wi-Fi six now, right, Tiffany? So let's not not, not today, not today. We'll have, we'll have part two. Uh, security is a very important aspect. You know, Wi-Fi, you need to connect and put your credentials and all that stuff. And five G, all that is going to happen with the network, so it's it's much secure. And uh, we do have another question here. So it says that there have been concerns about. Um, well, there's two questions here. So I spoke. Uh, I have spoken with wireless tower engineers, and they are concerned about the energy that it be, is being given off. Um, my suggestion, because to be completely transparent, my I've been on the phone so much promoting this webinar, my left arm has been going numb this week. So, I mean, it, it's, it, it is possible. And so I was like, you know, I, let me get to the bottom of this. You know, I know that the, the, there is an organization that's looking over this, but just to be on the safe side, I went ahead and ordered two of the EMF scanners just to see how much frequency is coming off the towers. If you're that concerned, order one, Amazon. <laughs> and so may, may, may I take in, do we have time for for yes. something that, yes. that that I that I reflect on and that I read into the question? And, and on the EMF side and the health part, I, I agree with your summary there. 
Tiffany uh, personally, in my own opinion. But one aspect which is very important is that to understand that it takes X energy to move a bit in the air. If you're going to move 100 times more bits in the air, you're going to consume more power. And, uh, and we've been working with one of the tier ones in Europe, and we can conclude that the 5G one band, mid band, is consuming three times more power than the uh, than the all the legacy components together, because there's so many more bits that are being used. So if you look at the US scenario where you have mid band, you have low band, and then you have the high bands where you're going to move much more bits. For sure, the power usage and from a sustainability perspective, you need to start optimizing networks and and really work through that. It's it's an aspect that I, he I'm surprised we don't speak more about, but for sure it's a huge huge impact on the power consumption of base stations and 75 percent of the overall network uh, power consumption of a mobile network operator is typically in the, on the radio side. So uh, that's an aspect, maybe that was what was uh, referred to, but when you see those numbers and you actually measure it, which we have done, uh, you start reflecting on what's going to happen from that perspective. Well, you did say an interesting thing there. So you talked about the base stations, but then you also talked about the radio wave. So which one's being monitored, monitored with the 2020 guidelines? How does that work? The 2020 like, guidelines. So, and, and so now you're... Okay, well, so, so now topics you're because I'm just trying to get a feel for I'm, what I think I'm they more are in too, the, because there's I'm, I was more speaking about the energy bill, uh, the power equipment on site, and the sustainability aspect, not the health act part. Okay, uh, okay, um, I guess I, and I guess they're kind of combining because I'm looking at another quote here or another question. It says there have been concerns about 5G heating up devices. And I did notice that my phone's been getting extremely hot this week. And I, like I said, but I don't know if there's any coincidence. So that's, I'm just trying to map it out. <laughs> that's, the the amount chip, of that's the chip inside the device that's getting hot because um, it's just, uh, it heats up. <laughs> it gets hot. <laughs> I think the power requirements are, are very important uh, as uh, Carl and Patrick mentioned. Yep. It does get hot. So. Don't sleep with uh, the phone next to you, for sure. <laughs> or anywhere on your body. <laughs> All right. So we really appreciate everyone coming out and joining us today. We've got our contact information listed on the screen and hope that you will join us next month where we will dive into the energy sector and talk about all the different sources for energy that are traditional, the power plants that are closing, and the shifts of how we consume and power everything that we are so you know uh reliant upon so please join us for that and then we also have our other upcoming webinars thank you so much to all my speakers for coming out and joining me today and sharing our knowledge on 5g and how people can prepare so you, you've got some clear paths as to the different opportunities that are out there and all of the different things that you can prepare for from your supply chain and everything else any final thoughts from our panel well, you, you're a phenomenal host, Tess. Yeah, good hosting. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for inviting. Thank you. And we're going to play a closing video and invite you to come visit us again on another Industry Insights webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Decades, trade shows have been the foundation of many business models until now. 
Businesses are silent, factories are closed, and trade shows are at a standstill. The virus is affecting businesses around the world. How will the IoT and tech industry survive? If you are looking to get your voice and brand heard, webinars are an efficient means to reach your audience and create a reusable source for lead generation. The energy sector is facing an extraordinarily difficult time, primarily due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the looming economic crisis. Keeping consumers under lockdown has sent fuel prices soaring to record lows. Natural gas is experiencing its largest annual decline in history due to COVID-19 and the exceptionally mild winter in the Northern Hemisphere. Prior to COVID-19, the energy sector was already experiencing a slow in demand. In fact, the coal industry has seen a 40% decline in the past five years. Although energy demand has dramatically decreased, the amount of carbon emissions has not significantly dropped as industry experts had hoped. Innovations for renewable energy, such as hydropower, wind, biomass, and solar are steps in the right direction, as well as transitioning from gas-powered vehicles to electric. But the power industry is in need of connected solutions to help maintain balance and preserve our natural resources if we want to return to a green and growing economy. Join us on Thursday, August 20th for Industry Insights webinar, Connected Solutions for the Power Industry, to find out more about these challenges and the new technology evolving Industry 4.0. Technological advancements in AI, predictive analytics, 5G, 3D printing, IoT, and telehealth are transforming the way we monitor, care, and repair ourselves. We are in the midst of an exponential paradigm shift as we evolve from traditional health practices for treating illness to a new approach that focuses on data-driven connected solutions and preventative care to preserve our well-being. Don't fall behind the digital curve. Get in the know by attending our upcoming Industry Insights webinar on Thursday, September 24th, Smart Solutions for Connected Health. Register now and I'll see you at the webinar. See you guys next time. Don't forget to register for Connected Solutions for the Power Industry. And until next time, bye.